Father, I ask once again that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The scene that John paints for us is a bleak one. Jesus stands before all the power brokers of Israel. There's probably not an Israelite more powerful than the high priest. What he says happens. The things that he commands take place. And here's Jesus standing before him. And the high priest is berating him with questions, trying to convince Jesus, trying to trap Jesus, to trick Jesus into giving himself away. He's looking for evidence they can use to kill him. Everybody knows the sham. Everybody understands that. But here's Jesus standing there in front of Annas, and Annas begins questioning him. And he asks, he says to Jesus, so I want to know what you've been teaching your disciples. What are you telling them? Because I'm sure that once I hear what you're telling them, I'll have all the evidence I need. And Jesus responds with a question. Why are you asking me this question? It's a, definitely a confrontational question that Jesus asked, and we can tell that because as soon as Jesus asks it, one of the guards reaches over and smacks him in the face. Everybody in the room can tell Jesus has asked a question that's confronting the authority of the high priest. And, and Jesus... Jesus is, is asking this question because I think even though he's going to go to the cross, he's not going to make it easy on Annas and Caiaphas and all the others gathered there to make that decision. As someone said to me this week, it feels like Jesus is going to make them squirm a little bit. Not unlike when Jesus calls the woman caught in adultery, when she's brought to Jesus, and they start having this dialogue, Jesus asks them a question, who brought her, and then he kneels down, and he begins to write in the dust. Just waiting. Waiting them out. Until eventually, they all walk away. And Jesus is making them squirm a little here, not to be vindictive. His whole point of confrontation is to try to open their eyes to what they're doing. Don't you see what you're doing? Do you really want to do this? Is this really the way you want your life to go? Are all, is all this power and all these possessions and all the things that you've accumulated, is it really worth this? Even if you don't believe Jesus is the Son of God, is it worth murdering an innocent person to keep what you have? Is it really is that really what you want? What I find in this question is that Jesus is continually sending out love notes to his enemies. Now that's not me. If I'm going to write a note to an enemy, it's not going to be a love note. I don't know about you guys. But we see Jesus doing that in a myriad of ways. One of the ways that some of you have heard Heard years ago, Dennis Kinlaw preached a sermon about Peter cutting off Malchus's ear. And how him healing that ear was a love note to Annas and Caiaphas and the religious leaders. And he imagines this scene in which the servant goes back to Caiaphas and says, Caiaphas says, how'd it go? Did you get him? Yeah, we got him. Do you have any trouble? Well, maybe just a little bit. What happened? He said, well, you know that big servant, Peter? Yeah, well, he swung a sword. Well, and he hit me with it. Well, it looks like you're okay. Well, yeah, that's just the thing. Are you sure we got the right guy here? It's a love note. And I think Jesus is sending him an, another love note here by saying, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. This doesn't have to be the choice you make. 
You know better. You can do different. And you know, love can be confrontational, but only if the motivation for the confrontation is in the best interest of the person we're confronting. Let's be honest. A lot of times, our motivation for confrontation is I want to get something off my chest. I'm angry. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. These people, this person hurt me. These people have done me wrong, and I want to make sure they know it. We're not thinking a thing about them. But Jesus is. Every word Jesus speaks is a word of love, even the confrontation. And Jesus doesn't do this so that he can, he can escape death. He does this to offer life. And the question that comes to my mind as I think through that scenario is this. When I find myself in a similar situation like Jesus, where I'm being maybe falsely accused, or I'm being opposed, or everything is squeezing in on me, how in the world can I come to the place where I respond to that and to people the way Jesus does? How do I do that? We might think, well, we just got to try harder. And trying hard isn't bad. But I think there's something deeper about getting ourselves into the place, finding ourselves in a place where we actually respond to situations like this in a way that looks similar to Jesus. I think it comes back to something in the way in which John shapes this whole story. You know, I've come to the conclusion that the gospel writers are a lot more brilliant and a lot more gifted and skilled than we may give them credit for. Sometimes one of, part of our arrogance being 21st century people is we look back to, in this case, the first century, and we think, well, you know, those guys were fine, but we are just so much smarter, and we just know so much more. We're able to do many more things. And there's some truth to that, but they're pretty smart people too. And God has gifted them, and the Spirit has inspired them. And one of the reasons the Gospels are different is because they all have different purposes. They all have different strategies in mind. They have a different audience. They're trying to accomplish something different. And John has a strategy here that's different than the other three gospel writers. And it centers around the denial of Peter. In all the other gospel, in the three other gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the story about Peter's denial, they're told in quick succession. He denies once, he denies twice, he denies three times. That's just a section But in John's gospel, we have Peter's first denial, then we have the scene of the interrogation, and then we have Peter's second and third denials. And you have to wonder, why does John do it that way? Why does John do it different than the other writers of the gospels? And there has to be some reason behind it. It, Because I'm convinced nothing in Scripture is coincidental. There's a reason behind it. Sometimes we miss the things that script, the writers of Scripture are trying to communicate, the nuances, the subtleties, because it wasn't written to 21st century people. It was written to 1st century people. Is it relevant for us? Oh, yeah. But it, what, we aren't the original audience, which is just a side note. That's why it's so helpful to understand people who understand context and help us grasp some of those nuances and subtleties. And I think John is subtly connecting this interrogation and the denials. And maybe what John is doing is not just sending a message to Annas and Caiaphas and the religious leaders. Maybe John, or Jesus, sending that message. Maybe Jesus is also sending a message to his disciples. But not directly, indirectly. You know, there's a way in which overhearing can be a powerful communication tool. I remember being in eighth grade, and there was a kid in my eighth grade science class who just didn't get along with the teacher. One of those, they were just always at each other. And they were probably both at fault. Now, I'm a lot more sympathetic to the teacher 
now than I was in eighth grade. But I, I can see how that student was probably driving them crazy. But they were always getting into it. And here's the thing that I found as a class. I've thought back on this. When the, the teacher would usually direct criticisms and, and commands and things at this one student. But here's the truth. We all got it. We all heard it. When he was upset at that student, we knew the lines to cross for the rest of us. If you're a parent and you have multiple children, you talk to one child about something they've done, but all the while what you're hoping is that all the other children overhear what you're saying and they get the message too. And you think of it the other way around as well. Someone comes to you and says, Wow, I really appreciate you. I love you. I, I'm just so grateful for you and the thing, who you are and what you're doing. And I just want you to know that. It feels awesome when people do that. But you know what takes that to an even higher level is when you overhear that person saying the exact thing, same thing to somebody else and they have no idea that you're hearing it. There's something even more powerful about that. And there is something in the, what Jesus is doing here that John and, and Peter, who are in the courtyard, and I'm assuming can overhear things that are going on, they are overhearing Jesus say to Caiaphas and to Annas, why are you asking me this question? Ask my disciples. They'll testify. They know. I trust them. I can hear Annas saying to Jesus, you trust them? Those guys? The guys who just deserted you? The disciples who, oh, I don't know, like Peter, who even as we're talking now, is denying that he even knows you? These are the guys that you have trusted your message to? These are the guys that you're relying on? These are the ones you want me to go ask? Come on, Jesus, you can do better than that. Really? And Jesus says, yeah, really. Really? It seems naive of Jesus to say that. He knows what's going on. He knows what's happened. He understands it. He knows they've failed him. And yet there is something in Jesus that when he thinks about his disciples and talks about his disciples, even with their failures, he says, I'm not giving up on you. I believe in you. I'm trusting you with my message, and I am, you're going to be my witnesses. It's a precursor to what he tells them face to face after his resurrection. He looks at them and says, you are my witnesses. It's on you. I believe in you that much. And I am convinced that one of the only way for us to respond in situations the way Jesus does is to believe and to embrace the reality that Jesus never gives up on us. How does Jesus respond? Seems though like John is saying, how does Jesus respond when those who are supposed to be his messengers fail him? He doesn't give up on us. And if we could grasp that truth, if we could internalize that truth, if we could live in that truth, it would change so much about who we are as God's people in this world. Because so much of how we operate is out of a spirit of insecurity. And when we operate out of a spirit of insecurity, we are continually having to, trying to prove to people that we're valuable. The way that we communicate about Jesus is, well, we got to use the most power. We got to use the things that everybody else says works instead of the strategy of Jesus. And it's not trying harder. It's having a want to. I think Jesus can look at those disciples and say, I can see that when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of them, they're going to be awesome witnesses. But the Holy Spirit can only get a hold of them because they have a want to in their spirit. Maybe the significant difference between Annas and Caiaphas and all those who are 
who are against Jesus and the disciples is that the disciples have a want to about Jesus and the others don't. And Jesus is not ignoring what they've done. He's not soft peddling their failure. This is not a free pass to do whatever they want to. He's not saying to them, oh, you know what? I know you guys have messed up a lot, but you're such swell guys that I'm I'm gonna trust in you anyway. This is not a free pass. This is grace. And this is hope in the reality of who we are as followers of Jesus. Because even after the Spirit fills them and they go out as witnesses, they still fail from time to time. They still struggle just like you and me. And in every one of those moments, their minds come back to this moment. And if Jesus won't give up on them in this moment, he won't give up on them on that moment. And if Jesus won't give up on us in that moment, he won't give up on us on our moments either. At the heart of the gospel, at the heart of of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we often think it means that we are committed to Jesus. And that's certainly important. But that's not the heart of it. The heart of it is Jesus is committed to us. And because Jesus is committed to us, we can be committed to him. Dan Wilt says that one of the great strategies of the evil one against us is to try to turn God's sentence periods into sentence question marks. So God looks at us and says, you're my witnesses, you're my beloved, you're my children. The enemy wants to make those statements questions. Is God, are we really God's beloved? Are we really his children? When he looks at us and says, I'll never give up on you, the evil one puts into our mind, will he really never give up on us? And I think John is telling us in this story, he will not. You can bank on it. It's the heart of everything we believe. You couldn't blame Jesus if he did give up on them here. I can't imagine how hurt he feels, how alone he feels in this moment. But he doesn't. Because Jesus understands he has been teaching, he has been modeling, he has been living the nature of the kingdom and the essence of who God is. That God is a shepherd who will continue to seek for that lost sheep. And God is like a woman. The kingdom is like a woman who loses a coin and she searches and searches until she finds it. And the kingdom is like a father whose son spits in his face and rejects him and rebels against him and loses everything he has, wastes it all, and yet welcomes him home. That is the essence of the kingdom because that's the essence of who God is. How do we bear witness to Jesus in this world in a way that looks anything like Jesus? It's a want to that is rooted and grounded in our God who never gives up on us. And my prayer is that you and I will truly begin to not only believe that, but embrace that and live that every day through the grace of Christ. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that even in our failure, you are faithful. Implant that truth deep into our minds, deep into our hearts, deep into everything that we are, that out of that truth, we may be Christ 
image-bearing agents of your kingdom.